You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Call. I've got Brad Hunt here with me today. Today's podcast, we're going to talk about wood stoves yeah. in a hot tent, primarily a teepee. You know, we've been on a lot of hunts over the years. We want to do a few episodes, probably a lot of episodes coming up, look for them, that get you thriving in the backcountry. Yes. I've noticed a lot of people have bought some of the gear, some haven't that we utilize in the mountains. Uh, and either way, there's a lot of, uh, there's a, still a lot to learn to maximize those tools. Yes. And wood stoves is one of those items. Hopefully, if you listen to this short podcast or watch it, we recommend that you watch it on the YouTube channel if you're listening to it because it's very visual. But either way, walk away from this knowing why you should get a wood stove, uh, how to maximize the efficiency of your current wood stove if you own one. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will just waste heat or uh, burn a lot, of wood. a lot of wood. They don't quite understand the best way to maybe light a fire in a stove, get it drafting properly, get it tamped down properly, d dampening, yep. uh, all that stuff. Uh, we cover it in the show. I really want people to go out into the mountains, be able to quickly run a fire efficiently, set up their stove properly, and and just just bask in the comfort enjoy the caveman tv of the backcountry <laughs> correct and you'd be surprised some of you maybe some of you not that um you know there's a bit of a lack of knowledge in this department yeah for sure so watch the show there will be links below for all the products that we mentioned we mentioned some fire starter we mentioned uh boot dryers we mentioned pumps air pumps air pumps uh various things that we yep. use in the backcountry the little tidbits of information and gear that we think you'll find useful. We spend 150 days a in the field sometimes per year. Mm -hmm. We use this stuff. We live with this stuff. We thrive back there. We think you can too. So check it out. Use the links. They help us wherever we can. We try to get a discount associated with those links. Sometimes we can't. If you use those links, you'll help us keep producing content like this and bringing it your way. Thank you so much for supporting us. Enjoy the show. Stay gritty. All right, folks. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Call. And today, I'm going to talk about using a wood stove in the backcountry. It's kind of our Thriving in the Backcountry series. I just got back from a hunt in Alaska with Brady Miller and Ryan Lampers, and we were in some nasty, wet country. We ran into tons of really great guys, young, old, out there grinding, trying to get themselves a moose on a public land type of do-it-yourself adventure like we had. Almost nobody that we ran into was running a hot tent with a, with a wood stove. Blows my mind. So I just was thinking about it. I just wanted to cover this subject one more time, maybe 10 more times. I don't know. Whatever it takes to get you guys to shift from the old school teepees uh, or old school dome tents and whatever that you guys have been using all these years. You can't go wrong with wood heat and it's a lifesaver. So when we were in Alaska, we, we carted this teepee around with the setup that we have and a wood stove. When we got wet and our boots got wet, each day or evening, whenever, we would just set up our tent, we'd throw in our wood stove, we'd crank up the heat with some wood, burn, our gear would dry out. Our boots would dry out. We have Graxaw boot dryers in the teepee and voila, we were good to go. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you the setup. I'm going to show you the stoves that we use, which stoves we like, which diff, what the benefits of each one is, which each stove is, and how to light a fire and run a stove. When I was a little kid, we, I grew up with a wood stove. That's the only heat we had in Oregon, in the rural area that I grew up in. I'm the oldest of eight kids. Dad and mom were young. I had young parents. They didn't have a lot of money and dad refused to pay for electric heat, which was a fortune. We had a wood stove. Running a wood stove is an art, like how you light it, how you get it running. And a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand how a wood stove works. And I've witnessed now being intense with other guys, even guys that are fairly accomplished. And I see them just burn, burn, burn wood inefficiently and also not be able to get their tent hot as they can. Each of these stoves have some advantages versus disadvantages. Some are lighter weight, some are a little heavier. 
we're going to get into real quick. I'm going to try to make this as speedy as possible for everybody listening and watching. Uh, but we're going to, I'm going to get in here and show you first off, what I'm going to show you is this is the peaks solitude teepee. We covered this in an earlier show a few months ago. Go back and check that out. We're hanging 50 pounds of weight from the trekkers inside this teepee. We're able to hang our wet gear, our pants, our, our rain gear, our socks, our, everything in these rafters up above on the trekkers. We're able to put our boots up there, two guys, our boot dryers dry out our stuff. The heat from the stove cooks inside, the heat goes to the top and the really convection warmth up there. You can get with a fan blowing on those boot dryers that air circulating dries out your stuff really quick and you have bone dry socks, boots, orthotics, everything every day when you go out and hunt. It's, it's just amazing. It changes your whole experience. So right now I'm going to go over the SXL. This is the seek outside stove. This is the SXL version. It means a short XL, I believe. This is the, this is the stove that we like to use pretty much um, for when it gets cold. Even like October, we're still kind of opting for this. It weighs a little bit more than some of the other stoves, which I'll go over in a little bit. But this stove is um, pretty easy to set up. You got your titanium sides here. Some of you may already know this. Fast forward to the section where I show you how to use the stove, because a lot of you probably, or maybe don't really understand how to maximize the use of the stove, okay? So I'm just gonna put this together real quick um, and uh, I'll show you this and I'll talk about, once I have it together, I'll talk to you about what it is that makes this stove kind of our go-to for late season when things get cold and when we just wanna have all the power we want for heat. And uh, we'll talk about the lighter weight option after this and kind of when we opt to use that over this setup but i will say like we tend to lean to the sxl for almost for almost everything after september so let me put it together all right i've got the sxl put together one of the reasons a couple of the reasons i like the sxl is it's pretty airtight when you run the solid side back the three sides, everything's pretty tight. And that means you don't have smoke or air seeping in. So you can control the, the draft a little more. You can burn the fire a little hotter and you can tamp it down and, and trap the heat in here and burn wood for longer. Keep more of the heat in the teepee, in your shelter, instead of escaping through the chimney. This is the flue that goes on top. It's, it connects right in here, just drops right in. It's pretty simple. All right. And um, I turn this off to the side so that when I'm burning, I can manage the air intake. So this right here, this is what allows more or less air to come in or out of your, out of your, uh, through your chimney. Okay, and then this is a spark arrester. It's supposed to stop the sparks so that you get fewer chunks of hot coals sucking up through the chimney and then landing on your beautiful teepee and burning holes in it. Um, so you want like a typically a, an eight foot pipe, maybe. Uh, they do have six foot pipes. It sh saves a little bit, but we tend to go a little bit taller in the pipe rather than shorter. Just, just to, just to keep your teepee from catching fire. Um, it's not a big deal. We've run real short pipes. Yep. We've had sparks land on it and burn little holes in it. And then we just put a little tape over it, little patch kit. It, you know, we've abused the heck out of them. You can get away with a lot, but if you want a nice clean shelter without the, the sparks really getting on you, run the eight footer. Okay. So that's some reasons why I like it. I also like that it's got a flat top because the flat top is easy to cook off of, which we do a lot of. We cooked fish in Alaska off of this with a little pan. We put our, uh, our little, uh, like mugs on there, 
pots of water. We boiled water on here. That way we were not totally relying on our gas stoves, like our jet boils and so forth that we use, which we, we tend to use the Minimo a lot. We didn't need to use gas. It's kind of comforting to know that when you're in the back country, that if you ran out of gas, no big deal. You can still boil water. You can still cook food right on top of and through your stove without, without uh, any hassle. It, it works pretty efficiently. The thing that uh, I don't like about pretty much every stove on the market right now is they're, they're kind of a pain in the ass to set up. They take a few minutes. Now, I complain probably the most out of the group of us, but the wingnet design, the, the rods, I can think of a billion ways to make this better, but nobody has yet, really. They still use kind of cheesy methods to put it together like you, like this was made in someone's garage. But it's what we have right now, it, and it is lightweight, and it does do the job. No questions asked. It does the job. It keeps your tent hot. It doesn't weigh very much, okay? Now, the question is, do you bring this or do you bring a U-turn, which is a lot lighter? And I'll show you real quick these dimensions on the U-turn stove. This is a large U-turn right here. We will use this. It's plenty to keep this tent warm. But when we really want to have comfort and it gets to be below 25 degrees on pretty regular basis, we're going to the SXL. We used to run this all the time. You can see it's just the same dimensions pretty much, but just not quite as wide. So it adds a few more ounces to run the SXL. You have your front door here, you have your top like this, but the side wall is a, is a piece of uh, this material here, which just rolls out and goes around the outside, okay? a lot thinner of a sidewall it does shave those ounces but the performance of the stove goes way down in my opinion um it doesn't conduct as well the other thing too is the stove pipe becomes smaller okay so instead of this diameter pipe right here you can see that you have a much smaller pipe right there so you can see like it's just a lot smaller, which then means you can have less stovepipe, which is great for weight, but hurts you again in performance. So the bigger, the, the you know, what makes fire burn? Oxygen. That's the fuel for fire, air, oxygen. And when you can have um, an airtight box, this one leaks a lot of air sucks in air from everywhere this one will smoke a little bit the u-turn smokes a little bit inside the teepee whereas the 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 sxl these solid side sided ones don't the bigger pipe allows you to suck more air in and get that fire hot and it breathes better it just the fire just breathes better we rarely get uh smoke in the teepee which is a common problem you have to sort of draft you have to have like have some skill and art involved in the in the u-turn where you sort of stoke it just right get the air going if you tamp it down too quickly or too soon you'll get smoke billowing through the cracks you'll get smoke throughout kind of like almost every time you run the stove you get a little smoke coming in here and there till it dissipates but with the bigger stove bigger pipe you don't have that the, the, the penalty is weight but once it gets below 30 degrees below 25 especially we're moving on to this this is just this is just a the weight that the weight penalty is worth it for those colder later season issues so in september when it gets a little cool and wet like this last elk season we probably won't bring the sxl definitely won't we would just bring the large u-turn or brad is going to show you the light outdoors stove here in a little bit. In the past, I've run a solo shelter, the Seek Outside Silex. I really like that that design. Just goes up with some trekking poles and it has a stove jack. And I've run this, which is the Cub U-turn. So you've got the medium U-turn, the large U-turn, the SXL U-turn, and the Cub U-turn. Now these are all the U-turns. Like I was saying, they're made out of the the this material here. 
and it makes up the three sides of your sh your shelter, which makes the stoves, it shaves that weight a little bit. In my opinion, as I've spent a lot of time in the mountains and in the woods, I, I, I like the U-turn less and less all the time. I like the performance I'm getting out of the SXL. If the weather is pretty mild and chill, then I'll deal with a U-turn just because I probably won't even use my stove, but once a week or once in a three-day hunt or five-day hunt, only if it pours rain and we get drenched, do I really break out the stove. If it's a situation where I'm using that stove constantly every day, every night, we might be cooking with it, all that kind of stuff. I prefer not dealing with the U-turn. The This little guy, which is the Cub, this is a great way to freeze your ass off uh, and just barely get enough warmth that it takes the edge off. But the whole time, you're just shoving it full of twigs. It's it's just, to me, this is useless. I've had it for quite a while. Um, it's lightweight for sure, but I found it insufficient. Over the years, we just keep going to bigger and bigger stoves just for comfort. Because the ounces that you're saving, like between this cub and that, large u-turn there's not that much weight difference especially if you're two guys bring something bigger so for the single shelter i run a medium u-turn i'm just gonna stay warm i'm not gonna i don't like to have to cut a billion pieces of sticks to just little tiny ones and then try to put them in the bigger the box the more you can stuff it with wood and the fewer times you have to add wood to the stove there's just benefits to going a little bit bigger, slightly heavier, in my opinion, over time. You don't want to chase heat. We say that all the time. It sucks to be at 10 degrees outside, trying to keep this shelter warm. Your stuff is all wet. And to keep this the tent hot, you got to just keep feeding that thing constantly. You can wait like three, five minutes, 10 minutes, and then you got to add more wood and add more wood. When you have an oversized box... You can add that wood, step away, and let it burn for 30 or 40. Even when it burns down and the coals are small, it's still so much, there's so many coals in there that the shelter's still warm. Okay, so that's kind of my rant a little bit. Um, again, SXL, when it gets real cold. Otherwise, I'd, I'd go U-turn large. And then for the single shelters, I'd go U-turn medium. And then... We'll discuss the light outdoors. I have not used it. Brad has used it quite a bit. And it's a totally different design. And it's got a lot of benefits as well. But what I want to get into now is I just want to show you how to really run a stove. Because how to light a fire in there quickly, easily, the tools we use to do it, our technique, and kind of show you maybe, hopefully, you can like hop in your own tent and you can start maximizing the efficiency and use of your wood stove that maybe you didn't know before, okay? So we're gonna do that next. We're gonna just light a fire and show you the, the method that we use. Roll this baby out. It's self-explanatory, really. Put the rings around it. There's some things that are a little bit frustrating when it comes to these rings. If you lose them, you're hosed, okay? Like, you can have some major problems. Also, the wing nuts that you use right here, they can get lost. The flue right there, the little metal piece that comes out, that can get lost. As you put the stove together, it's so annoying because the parts are easy to lose, drop in the grass. We have spent hours at times looking for a piece that fell. So we always pack extra wing nuts, extra rings. At this point, we're kind of done with the whole it's kind of frustrating. I think there's a better way. But in the meantime, this is what tools and... And I'm not... Well, I am complaining. All right. Over the years, I gotten tired of blowing up air pads. And so we have this nifty tool by Flextail. And I like the 2X. Is that right, Brad? Uh, I couldn't tell you. I have the same one. It's the bigger one. It's the bigger... There's like three, I think. This is like the middle one somewhere in there. Don't get the small, small one. Nope. And... uh it's an LED light, and uh, it blows up your air pad. Push the button twice, and it will inflate your air pad. I just have a cheap... I bought this for 20 bucks, I think, or something on eBay. 
Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, you can buy it on Amazon for cheap. Tyvex uh, ground cloth. Lightweight, easy to use. Seek Outside makes another one that's a little thicker, like felt type material. Works great as well. It's cheap. You can buy it at Go Hunt. Use the code Gritty over there. Anyway, um, I'm going to air that up right now. All right, this little flex tail, after it airs up your air pad, um, you can hold the button down here, the power button, and it'll turn on an LED. And then it has graduated levels of brightness. There's three settings. And you got a little hook here, and you can hang it up. It's LED lighting. It'll light up the whole teepee. It's pretty darn nice, and it's rechargeable. doesn't weigh that much. It's a light, and it airs up your pad. There's different nozzles for different air pads in the industry so i love it you'll want one this is the uh the u-turn size pipe you can see there's a massive difference here between those two pipes okay like i said the thick thicker the pipe the bigger the pipe the more oxygen the better the hotter the stove gets the the easier it is to burn a fire to draft it the whole thing the other thing is, uh, you see how you can adjust the airflow here with the flue that, and this little sliding tin right here. I hate this thing. It's annoying. Um, and uh, this right here is the old school one. It, it, it feeds in like so, okay? Um, there's a little spark arrestor, which is just like a little metal net mesh that drops in here. And then this little guy... This little welded piece it comes in like so and then you just turn this like this kind of old school style this is a lot more efficient easier to use i believe drafts better more easy to control than this little tassel this little thing which constantly falls out hangs funky we're always bending it to try to give it some tension you can't adjust the stove as easily i despise it and pretty much despise it but I can see why um, the company might get rid of this design because sometimes these welds snap off. I've had that happen before and then you have no flu at all as this just free hangs and twiddles about. Um, and I, I imagine this is probably a little harder to manufacture than, than, than a slot and a little metal tab. Still, um, if I had a choice, I like this style flu way better than that thing over there but again um with what we're working with here um i think the newer ones all come like this so anyway that's just a little side note but the stove by the way the stove pipe it goes over the top of the flue i've seen guys take their stove pipe and put it inside the flue like this well, but then smoke kind of comes out because when when the pipe is over and the smoke comes through it can't draft through that slot but i've seen guys put it here and then they can't turn the flue either now it's not as applicable here uh but just just know that the pipe goes over this when you're setting up the stove and you're you've got it on the ground i don't like my stove to be moving around so i tend to use these feet right here and i screw them up where i want them Okay, to countersink this rod. So when I get my stove where I want it, let's say it's uneven. Okay, the back is a lot higher than the front. Okay, I'll roll this little doohickey foot up like this where I want it. Then I'll push this into the ground like that. Boom, and it stops at the foot. Now my stove is real solid. It doesn't wiggle. It doesn't move. A lot of guys, I see them, they, they'll run it like this where the foot is just completely, um, they just kind of use it as like, the, like this, as a, as a foot, and they just set it down. And then they try to adjust the whole rod up or down. But then when you push on it, it just moves around. So if you actually use this, to adjust your height for each foot depending on your uneven ground and then you just countersink that piece 
now you have a much more stable stove like this. So when you open the door and you slide it and you push wood in, the stove isn't like moving around. So that's just a little little trick. The other thing is, think of smoke. It follows, uh, it, it rises, okay? So if your front door is higher, like a little bit right now, if it's higher than the back, it's not going to draft as well. That smoke's going to kind of want to come out the front door if it's tilted forward. So the more you can lower the front a little bit. So in this case, I need to, I need to take this foot right here and I'm just going to roll it a little bit. And I'm going to roll this foot too. So it's a little bit higher. That way, when I push this into the earth, like I did, there's a little bit of a slope backward. Now that smoke will draft, it'll rise. And as it rises, it's funneled to the back where the chimney is. Okay. So that's kind of how I set it up. Now this is nice and stable. It's countersunk in the ground. It's level with a slight, slight slant toward the chimney, up toward the chimney. Now we're ready to light a fire and get this puppy burning hot. Favorite saws right here. Whenever you're packing a, a stove, well, even when you're not, saws are legit. We ha have been able to do most of our backcountry hunts with this Silky Pocket Boy 130. It's just a tiny little saw. Doesn't weigh very much. Super effective. It folds like so. Boom, goes right in your pack. I don't even like to leave this home ever, even when I'm not burning wood, because you can erect a shelter. You can do all sorts of things with this saw. It has become so useful. It's kind of one of those things we, at least one of us brings, if not both of us. Now, this is the Silky Big Boy 2000 360. And uh, this is a little heavier, of course, bigger saw. And it folds as well, like so, okay? But holy moly, is it a powerhouse. If you're going to be in an area where you got to chop a lot of stuff. Or build a log cabin. Build a log cap, <laughs> yeah. Get, get yourself uh, some serious wood. You're chopping down trees. It's super late season. You got three guys. A guy's carrying shelter teepee. Man, this saw, for some place like Alaska, this could save your life. This thing is legit. If you're, if you're, uh. It's not that heavy when you come for, for what you're getting out of it. Anyway. Well, something like that is perfect when you have horses or llamas and you're going through a trail that has a bunch of deadfall. Yep. This thing is unbelievable. Uh, cuts very quickly because of that long stroke. But I'll show you this little silky right here. So getting wood for a fire is kind of an art. You want various sizes of wood. Um, big to small or small to big. I'm just going to stack a little bit here. Typically what we'll do is we'll kind of grab this little like light stuff, tiny stuff. Um, if it's a really wet area like Alaska, we're looking for uh, deciduous or I mean uh, evergreen trees, junipers and, and like, well, pines and firs, stuff like that. And what we're trying to do, spruces mostly, and what we're trying to do is where all the branches above are alive, but the base are dead they're also under the fir boughs or the or the pine or the spruce boughs so you can reach in there and you can break off or cut off all those nice dry branches they're not laying in the ground in the snow they're not laying in the ground getting rained on and soaking up a lot of water they're kind of under a little umbrella so you're pulling them right off the tree but they are dead and you can gather a lot of dry wood that way by grabbing it from 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 under a spruce um and uh, all those lower limbs on those evergreen trees tend to die and, um, and then just hang on for years and years and years in that, in that dry little pocket. And then you can come along and snatch it for your little, for your little fire, okay? So as you see, I'm building like a, a little pile of finer stuff for starting the fire and uh, bigger, thicker stuff as the fire grows you throw on a little bit bigger piece of wood. One of the things that we will do is uh, when we get bigger and bigger pieces, well, and we're in a hurry, 
it's faster to break stuff than it is to saw sometimes if it's the if it's the right size and so we'll throw we'll use the uh, rock method to get some wood pretty quick um you know you break it over your knee you you break it with your boot right and you just start piling up a stack as everybody's kind of tucking into the tent and you're airing up your air pad you know and uh you're getting that wood ready for the shelter okay but then you'll get to some thicker stuff and it's like, do I do the saw? Do I not do the saw? Is it time? Well, one of the things that you can do is rather than saw, after you've kind of exhausted just snapping it on your leg or under your boot, you can do a couple of things for getting wood. I apologize to those of you who already know all this stuff, but a lot of you don't. So this is, you know, this is good. Good for you guys, but um, you can grab this wood. Uh, next thing you know, you see this, Ryan will do this a lot because he's not as strong as I am and stacked. So he'll he'll do this thing where he comes along and he'll, he'll do like a, a cut like this. He'll score it and then he'll break it. So he'll do a quick score. He won't have to cut through the whole thing. You know, you just do a quick score it's a little bit thick. You're like, oh, that's too thick for me to just break, score it, and then, and then, uh, man, a little bit more. Break it, right? And you just keep stacking your wood. Another technique that we often use, depending on where we're at, we'll grab, especially if you got some big logs, Get yourself a rock like so. And you can do it a lot of different ways, but say you put a rock right here. Okay, you got your rock there. You build your little your little uh, ledge and then close your eyes. You don't want to lose an eye. You can stomp on it with your foot. But other times you can just grab a sharp rock, stand back like so, close your eyes, and then you just snap your branch. Um, it's kind of an awkward one, right? You just snap it, and you can throw a log after log and just, I've done that with some real big rocks, and then we're just like chop, 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 chop. Got a little bit of wood here. I'm gonna bring it inside. All right, I got the stove. This is how I would set the stove up uh if i were camping hunting and i would set the the stove kind of in the center like it is but i'd angle the door a little bit towards me like this so i can access it and start it and manage the fire now it's a little bit crowded once you're running the sxl it's wider than like a couple inches wider than the other stove so you've got to be aware that you don't get too close don't burn your sleeping bag don't burn things, you know, we'll, we'll pooch out the side. We'll use the trekkers to sort of make it a little bit bigger. Um, and then you can also angle your bag a little bit and slide it down, right? So that I'm kind of angled away, like toward the door like this. The other guy can angle a little bit as well and you can maneuver for more room. Uh, but that's just kind of how it goes when you're using a stove in a teepee you guys got to be aware that you're pretty close to that fire um and uh we'll manage the temperature of the stove how hot we get it how much we vent this the teepee and so forth so that we're comfortable um and uh but what i'm going to show you now is starting the stove i'd typically be in my sleeping bag in the morning and uh i'd get the stove going like so i've got my wood here to burn i like to uh, bring my top lid in to the tent, I just take it off my sleeping bag. It kind of has all the things in it, my headlamp, you know, I've got charger and stuff in this stealthy pouch. And But I got my fire starter here, I got my stereo pin, I got my spoon, I got everything kind of that I need, toothbrush, toiletries, always kind of in that top lid. So all I gotta do is detach it, shove my bag at the bottom of my sleeping bag. I'm in the tent, I'm good to go. I don't have to look for things in my pack because everything I usually need when I climb inside the tent is right here and that includes our fire starter 
which we've been using mostly the, the last year or two, this stuff called S-Bit. It's cheap, works really great. Um, it smells like a dead animal sometimes after it's been in your bag <laughs> for a year. Well, you're not even a year, six months, I don't know. But uh, it's combustible, whatever that is. It's solid fuel cubes and uh, it smells like fat like beef fat or something that goes a little rancid or fish oil or so, sometimes but it's not that bad um but we we run this it's cheap you can buy it e-s-b-i-t check uh our our description field for a link because uh we're trying to put as many links to this stuff as we can we don't know if we can get a kickback from a lot of this stuff but if we can you can find it below and uh, that'll help us get a little small um, affiliate kickback for that if you do buy it. But um, that's what we've been using. We, we've used trioxane tablets for, for a long time too, but they're expensive, hard to come by. Um, and uh, these are a lot cheaper, cheaper and easier to run, okay? All right, so this is how I start a fire, okay? There's a million ways to do this. This is how I do it. Nobody has to get all upset over it. Use it if you like it or don't. This is what I've found to be pretty effective in getting a fire going quickly and easily, okay? I used to do it a lot of different ways. Now I have it pretty dialed. It's pretty simple and it's quick, okay? Um, I've got my lighters in here, various lighters, Bic lighters. Um, and then I always carry with me an, an electronic rechargeable um, windproof lighter. Like this is a pyro putty old one that I've got. Okay. It's electric. It has a charging port. Um, you can charge right here with a USB cable, charge this thing up and you push this little button and it does this little purple fire light. You see that? Yep. Okay. It's windproof and, uh, it'll light combustible things on fire and you have that as an option there have been times where i have had a trouble getting a gas lighter to go off but the electric one always works so i like to carry that here are my gas lighters the cheap big ones okay and then uh, i keep all that kind of stuff in here along with this s bit fire starter in this uh, little fire starter pouch i've got here i'll grab a little s bit like this okay and uh, I don't need that much and it varies depending on how wet or dry the wood is or how fast I want to start a fire or how much I have left and how many days in the hunter left and so on. But I'm going to grab a pretty big chunk right now for this. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure my stove door is open and I'm going to open my flue all the way so that I can start drafting, drafting air through this as I get the fire going. Next thing I do is I take my fire starter, this S-bit, I put it on this little stick. There's a reason for that. I need this to burn for, for about a minute or two before I put it into the stove because it burns out really cool. It, it, it can, until it gets a good burn on it, it will blow out. Okay. Right, Brad? Yep. It kind of just needs to burn a second. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a little, it's, it's, it's slow to get it's hot. It's finicky. Yeah. <laughs> but once it burn, once it gets going, it goes. Okay. So I've got the flu open door open. And I'll start the, the piece of fire starter like so on this little stick, okay? Notice I'm letting it burn a minute, okay? Because if I were to take away the lighter, it may not hold. Now I'll just let it burn for a second and flicker. Notice I haven't put any wood in there. I haven't done anything. I haven't even, I don't really care. I'm going to let this fire starter catch for a second, okay? Now that it's going... I am going to deliberately put this fire starter into the stove under the chimney or close to it. And I'm just gonna set her down, okay? Okay, if you look inside there, you can see that fire starter is burning right above my chimney, okay? What I, and that's important because I want the, I want the air to draft up the chimney through, okay. from the front door. If you, a lot of guys start their fire right in the front of the door. Well, it wants to draft out the door instead of out the back. We're trying to create airflow that sucks through the door up the chimney. And once you get a draft going, you don't have to blow on it. You just let it go. And the best way is you have to heat up your stovepipe 
to get mm-hmm. that draw to really draw. So what you're yeah. doing is really heating up the stovepipe more than anything. Exactly. So now I'm going to lay here and I'm just going to start stacking little tiny pieces of wood on top of this thing. I'm just going to grab these little dry pieces, these little guys, just laying here sideways in my peak sleeping bag. And I'm just going to like, just lay a stack on there and get this. And the smaller the pieces, the more readily they burn. And um, it's it's pretty easy to get a little a little fire going over there. I prefer, by the way, some sort of evergreen tree to um, a deciduous tree like these. But I'll take what I can get, and uh, I'll start throwing wood in there. Okay, I just take these this chunk of wood and I just like kind of reach in there and I put it right on top of those flames. Okay. And I let that thing burn these little sticks. I'll open this little flue at the bottom, give it a little more air. This little vent, I should say on the bottom. And, um, you can hear it sucking air. Now, if I close this door just a little bit and I play with the the door, the opening of the door, if I open it all the way, it actually gets less air flowing toward it. If I close it a little, you can kind of hear it and see it. That's too much. Right about there, it's sucking some air. Okay. And it's pulling it up through the pipe. And, uh, it's starting to get a little hotter. So I'm just going to keep throwing a little bit of wood on top of this. That's how you know it's drafting. It's, it's picking up the oxygen through the door. So I don't have to blow on it. I don't have to do anything. The air is sucking in and getting that uh, wood to, to light up. And the trick really is to keep putting the smaller pieces on for a while. You know, let it let it eat. Let it get plenty of of uh, wood going. Um, and then as it gets hotter and hotter, you can graduate to a little bit bigger piece of wood and start going a little bit bigger. And you can keep playing with the door the opening of the door and how how much air you want to let into the stove, okay? And voila, it's burning pretty quick, okay? And it works nicely when you get the fire toward the back. We're going to get a little bit of grass burning here because the stove is... I didn't pull this grass out and it's pretty low. So we're going to get a little smoking uh, underneath, but that's just burning the grass. It's not a big deal. I have lit the grass on fire pretty, pretty solidly in, at times and uh, <laughs> had a little in, in a uh, tent. But if you, if you get the fire going pretty slow, it won't do that. But all that smoke you're seeing isn't from the stove. It's from the, the grass that touching the stove right now. Um, like I said, usually we'll kind of scratch it out or there's no grass anyway because it's late season and there's the vegetation is pretty much gone. Okay, you see that fire, Brad? Yes, sir. So right now, I'm just going to keep letting it breathe. I'm going to try to get it to burn. Keep burning. Um, and the advantage of this of this um of the sxl is the bigger pipe better airflow it's sealed more now if i go like this and i start to close this door you can sort of mess around with where you get the most suction the best draft to get the wood to burn then also, if you mess with the flue here on the side and you close it off and you kind of make the air 
pocket the or the air chamber smaller around the pipe and then you mess with the door those things will affect how much air it will suck through and draft okay and uh you can get a fire going pretty quick i see a lot of guys just leave the door wide open sometimes like wide open and they'll leave this flue wide open okay and it's like oh wow it's burning hot it's it's taken off the more i open the door the more oxygen it gets and then it doesn't always work that way um once the fire reaches a critical stage and it's sucking enough sometimes you want the door wide open other times you'll get a little bit a better result if you shut the door just a little bit and it causes it the 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 heat from the fire to suck more cool air in and ram it up the chimney okay and it'll burn hotter back to the tool we used earlier brad um in alaska especially <laughs> this is pretty sweet this flex tail that we use to air up our air, air mattress you take this puppy and you put it on there just right. You're of course gonna supercharge this fire. Get it burning real hot. This is rechargeable by the way, and I haven't charged it since the last hunt. But you can like stick it in the corner and whoom, it'll, take off real quick and get your fire going a little bit hotter we recharge it using uh solar panels and uh so on this isn't the best wood and you're you're often sometimes stuck with that um i would much rather have something with pitch pine pine tree or something like that it'll burn a lot better hotter but it'll do as long as it's dry and it's a little bit of an art and then the, the mistake guys make, a lot of guys make, is they want their fire hot, right? So they they think, it, they hear it and they see that it burns hotter when the door is open, okay? And they see that it's burning real hot when the chimney flue is wide open. And so they're like, they leave, they leave it like this, okay? This isn't nearly hot enough and there's not enough coals in there yet for me to illustrate this point very easily, but I don't care, I don't have all day, I'm, this is just for illustration purposes, but what we would typically do is we get this thing just cranking, right? Once it's burning hot like this and you're starting to get some coals, a lot of guys will make the mistake of leaving the door open or they will close it like this somewhat and they'll leave this flue open. Well, dude, all my heat right now is somewhat radiating out of the box a little bit, but mostly it's going up this giant hole you have. You have a massive hole. You have a giant chimney hole and all your heat is going out through that top instead of into my shelter. I don't want that. I want to maximize the heat coming to me in this shelter. So if you close the door just a little bit, kind of close off and you do it a little slow, a little bit at a time, then come over here and you kind of, I like to jockey the flue closed a little bit, but not all the way. I don't like to smother it all at once. I like to do it a little more slowly. Sometimes you'll get some smoke coming out. If you do it with the U-turn, uh, you'll, you'll almost always get some smoke coming out. But already, like I can feel all of a sudden, this thing is just radiating heat. Radiating. Like, this whole teepee got way hotter all of a sudden. And I close this vent all the way. I've closed the door all the way. And I close this flue most of the way. All of a sudden, this whole thing got... All that heat that was escaping out the chimney is now forced to come out through induction outside through the stove itself. Now it's like so hot, I gotta like scoot back. It's like starting to get real warm in here. Well, that's how you burn a lot less wood. 
you you kind of let it run like this and you'll find and you can adjust the flu like if you feel like it's getting too cold give it a little more oxygen go i don't know man open this chimney up a little bit let a little more draft open your little vent down here and be like okay i want a little i want to turbo it up a little bit i want a little more air coming through but i don't want to lose it all out my chimney and that i think is one of the number one things i see guys do is they just keep throwing wood in it, trying to make it hot, and they get this thing like a bonfire as if it's outside. And they they get it raging in there, but they're going through wood like mad. It's just stacks and stacks of wood because they never, ever close this flue down and trap the heat inside. It'll burn, it'll simmer. Those coals will generate heat for hours without having to add more wood, especially in the SXL. We'll sit here for the next hour, hour and a half, just cozy and warm, never add another log. We'll stuff this thing with big logs, medium, small. We'll load it all up and then we'll tamp it like this. And then we'll sit back and we'll enjoy the heat for the next two hours. We'll go, we'll fall asleep. It'll burn depending on whether you have some real dense juniper type wood that burns real hot in a long time. Depending on the wood you have, you can, we've had this thing burn six to eight hours um, solid without having to add more wood to it. Most guys will burn through their wood in one hour or two hours, you know, um, as they go to sleep because they'll leave these the flues open. They'll leave it too vented. They won't choke it down. Now you cannot, this is feels nice actually <laughs> right now. You cannot get this running like this, uh, as efficiently when you use a U-turn stove. The U-turn stove doesn't seal as tightly and doesn't draft as easily. And so when we really want to burn hot, also the surface area in this is a lot larger because it's wide. The height, I think, is about the same. You don't really need height as much as I think you need uh, width. Width. Mm -hmm. width will give you more burning surface. The, the length is nice. Put, we put logs in about yay long about so big we can put this door's rather large we can put some real big logs in this and we do and then we just let it burn and our stuff is up here in the top hanging from these trekking poles right up in here you know you got a pair of socks like sitting right here by the chimney everything about this gets nice and warm and hot and then what we'll do is we'll take these boots like i said before i'll take these boots I'll put them right here in the peak of the teepee like this sideways where, and I'll put my Graxaw boot dryer right inside that, the top of the boot and I'll plug it into my battery, like my dark energy solar, uh, my ba dark energy battery pack and it'll run that little fan and it fan is really efficient, like a little computer fan and it'll it'll suck all this heat that's gathering in the teep and the top of the teepee and it'll suck it right into the boot and it'll really dry out that boot. No problem. And, uh, Brad can stick his boots on that side and I can put mine right here and then we can continue to hang our jackets over these, these trekking poles and you can hang 50 pounds of gear up there. I'll hang my backpack when it gets soaked, I'll take my initial ascent and I'll just put the whole pack up there and just let everything be, off the ground kind of hanging there and the, the teepee can hold that load and uh, I'll dry out all my stuff and um, it's really tough to beat I, I just I, I feel for guys when we were in Alaska we talked to a few people they said I got wet on the first day of the hunt and I stayed wet the whole hunt for 10 days 12 days my boots were wet on day one and they were wet on day 10 day three day five like their boots never dried out their socks were always wet some guys had a dome tent with a propane like tank and then propane a heater like a buddy heater like almost. a buddy heater and stuff propane heat is really wet heat it doesn't dry like wood heat does plus you have to worry about when you run out of propane we can get left by that pilot for a month out there in the middle of nowhere and we'd have heat stove. We'd be dry all the time. We can cook fish. We can cook moose meat. We could fry it in moose fat, which we did, all on the wood stove system. 
It doesn't weigh very much. This whole system right here, I don't know what it weighs, Brad, maybe three and a half, four pounds. Yeah, for the SXL, I think it's like three and three quarter roughly. Is that what it weighs? I, I don't quote me on it, but it's pretty close. And then, then the teepee itself is one and a half pounds and Dyneema, the sill is around two pounds maybe? Yeah, I think it's like two and a half. Two and a half. So mm -hmm. one buddy carries the two and a half pound shelter. The other buddy, buddy carries the three pound stove. How could you ever leave it behind? This thing is cooking, dude. This thing is cooking. <laughs> And uh, one thing that's cool about the Peaks teepee, there are vents in the top, but there's also, you can essentially vent right above your head, which we'll do all the time. Woo, that stove is, that stove is nice. I like heat. I really do. Um, I just don't, man, guys, for you Alaskans, upgrade, my friends. So you can run uh, the vent right here and you can just kind of open this and we'll open it on the other side as well and get a little cross flow sometimes. If we're like, whoa, Brad, we got this SXL cooking. It's too hot. We will back it off. We'll open these vents real quick, let a little air in and then we'll put it right back to closed. Just, you can manage it however you like per your needs. Um, but this is a game changer. You can sit in here. You can have your dinner, you can be cozy, you can be warm, your stuff can be dry. And I really think the SXL is the ideal size for, for like I said, once you're, once you're dipping below that 30 degree mark, especially 25 degrees, get rid of the large and go to the SXL. The performance improvement is astronomically higher in comparison. The only other thing we've considered or I've thought about is a large, not in the U-turn. Back in the day before the U-turn was, before they came up with the U-turn, the large ran just like this and it burned hot on some days that were like 10 degrees outside, five degrees in a shelter about this size. It was seriously legit um and i haven't tried it in years actually uh because once we went to the u-turn we kind of stayed with that but the u-turn again has that smaller pipe i don't think it gets nearly as hot and it leaks air it doesn't trap heat as easily uh it doesn't draft as well so performance wise but again like the sxl is just marginally heavier for that powerhouse of heat, I just think it's worth it. 100% worth it. We can we tend to just keep carrying it no matter what. Um, and it will heat the um, the Red Cliff, which is like a three-person teepee that Seek has. So it, this SXL is, man, it's, a, it's perfect. It's a powerhouse for this Solitude or like a Cimarron. But when you... When you go, you can also run this in the Red Cliff and it's beautiful. It's, it's a nice, for that three man, it works. So when you're doing with the large U-turn or just the large, or just the large stove in general, um, it's kind of nice for September. It's nice for those mild temps where you get wet, but, um, I can't recommend the SXL enough really at the end of the day. And then you just know you're going to be cozy and warm, be able to stay those late season nights Brad and I were in uh, negative five, negative 10 degree temps last year with this thing. It was such a refuge, uh, such a relief to come back, climb in and get this puppy going and just feel like the warmth and restore yourself throughout the night. When you get up in the morning, your boots are completely dry and supple. You throw in like your sheep feet orthotics, put your boots on, your clothes are all dry, your socks are dry, your feet are dry. When you step out, you're not putting on wet, frozen boots. You're putting on dry, comfy boots. And immediately as you go out in the morning, everything's like day one. It's new. So I can't say it enough. I, I, I feel bad. A lot of those guys that we met in Alaska that aren't running stoves, I'm like, man, you're missing out. You got you to gotta, you gotta quit worrying about the fact that it's floorless. You got to adopt it. You got to go for it. It will utterly change your your hunt, your late season, all your hunts for the rest of your life. You will never go back. Spend one night 
in a floorless shelter with a, with a stove, you will not go back, period. The end, you will not go back. I have yet to find someone who has gone back. The other thing that people think is that this floorless shelter isn't robust enough. They're always bringing some kind of Hilleberg on a trip. They're like, ah, teepees, they can't. Yes, they can. We've been using these teepees on every hunt we do. And we pitch these things on the top of mountains in sheep country and goat country. So I challenged some guys to, to put it, we put it in the, through the paces. Lampers and I have not actually stopped using teepees yet. Every hunt we've tried, we have brought it and used it. So the idea that you need a freestanding dome shelter, I'm sure there are those search situations where, you know, you're climbing K2 or whatever. I get it. Like if you're, if you're, if you're ice climbing or something like that, but for hunts, I can't really think of a hunt where this isn't what you use. And I'll hear guys say, well, you know, like, especially guides and outfitters. They're like, nah, we need that dome tent, da 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 da. They get their boots wet. They're wet for days. Um, you don't need to. You can run this. And they're like, well, there's no wood. There's wood almost everywhere. We find it in the desert. We find it in the Badlands country. You got to pack it half a mile. Yeah, we find wood. We truly find wood on every hunt. Even if you're in sheep country and it's all rocks, at some point you can say, hey, we're going to take two hours and we're going to drop an elevation to the timber line and we're going to dry out for the next day and we're going to go back up. You can, even that night, you can go, we're going to drop down, warm up and come back. It's, 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 it's a game changer. So I think I beat that dead horse enough. So I'm going to close this out. Um, learn how to work that stove, learn how to start a fire efficiently. I mean, this thing is like an oven right now it is just bacon i don't know if you can see the heat waves coming off of this through that camera but she's hot like right here my knee everything is like i can feel that radiating heat um and i haven't put more wood in. i didn't put much wood in it to begin with i mean i only probably filled one third of this thing up with that wood but with the with the with the the chimney closed off and the and the thing tamped down and the door and all the vents closed all that heat is just trapped and its only escape is into the shelter instead of out the chimney. Changes everything. Try it. Play around with it. Learn how to run a stove, a wood stove. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's so versatile and useful, especially for the backcountry. Can't say it enough. Hope you found this useful. Check out the description field, as always, uh, with our videos. See how you can uh, save on gear. And how you can help us out. Because every time you use a code or a link that we've provided, you help us out. If you've got questions, leave them in the description field. We'll do some more videos on other stoves. The U-turns, little tricks with those. We'll talk about the light outdoors stove. And, and uh, a few more things. But hopefully this helps you thrive in the backcountry on your next huge big hunt. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you got a lot of information out of it. I hope it, this content helps you thrive in the backcountry. If you like this show and you want to support us and you want to help us make more content like this, go to the description field of our videos. You'll find links to the gear and the equipment that we mention in each video. And when you use those links, often you save, but it also helps us continue to bring this show mm -hmm. to you. Thank you for always subscribing to our videos and liking our videos. This show is possible because of you. So thank you. And as always, stay gritty.